Hi, I'm Richard Martin from Food Republic, and we're here for the second installment of the TalkHouse Food Republic Collaborative Podcast. And in today's guests, we have Paul Cahan from Chicago, Mark Eibald from New York. We're very excited about this. These guys uh, know each other's work very well, but have never actually met up until now. And we are here at the Sonos store on Green Street in Manhattan. They are graciously hosting us here for this podcast. Uh, it's an awesome place to come in and check out the Sonos equipment. I myself got a test of the recent Sonos One, which is their new speaker, and it sounds amazing. So come on by and check it out if you're in New York or in another city that has a Sonos store. Or look them up at Sonos.com. But now let's talk about this podcast. Mark Eibald is an amazing musician. I think I've seen him more times than I can count. Uh, most famous for probably playing bass with a little band called Pavement that pretty much ruled the 90s for me and a lot of other people. Uh, he later has played in Sonic Youth and he still dabbles in bass playing, I think, around once in a while? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, technically, yes. Technically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Kahn, his uh, recent cookbook, our brand new cookbook, uh, The Publican, is um, dedicated to recipes from one of his most famous restaurants among many in Chicago, um, Avec, Blackbird, Big Star. If you've been to Chicago, chances are you've eaten at one of his places because some local has said that you absolutely have to go there. So I'm going to let these guys take it. Thanks again to Sonos. Thanks again to Talk House. And uh, make sure you subscribe to the Talk House podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts on Apple um, or Spotify or wherever else. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You want to talk about this chicken right out of the box? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's in the fridge I'm right curious. now? Uh, yeah. So um, I, I took a look at this, at, at the cookbook yesterday. And because uh, I've, you know, I've never been to, I never got to go to Publican. I, um, I, um, well, it's been like 10 years since I've been in Chicago, but um, uh I'd always heard about it, and so I was looking at these recipes, and I, I, mean, I love cookbooks. I, I, I'm, I buy t way too many of them. And uh, that chicken recipe and its intro um, made, you know, I thought, like, okay, I have to try this. So I boned out a chicken nice. yesterday. Spatchcocked the chicken, pulled out the Ye breastplate. Yeah, except it didn't really go as, as, uh, planned. as, as well as planned. <laughs> I, it got a little messy, and... Um, that's only food. That's a uh, cool thing. It's yeah. can't really mess it up. But yeah, it's in the fridge, uh, seasoned right now. I stuffed it into like a little uh, plastic container. Um, did did you get? Did you use espalette pepper? Uh, no, but I think that's supposed to be in the next in the marinade. Is that in oh, the yeah, original? Oh yeah, you salted season? it. At I, this I point. salted and peppered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. I'm going to marinate it today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you weren't supposed to pepper it, but I'm I'm not going to yell at you. Okay, good. It's just salt. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I mean. I'm I'm a Judy Rogers fan too, Me so too, big time. Uh, it was cool that you know you you mentioned her in that recipe, and um, I, I'm I I probably should have let it sit out and dry. I don't know if is that the way the way you do it, or do you? Um, you can just dry it off with paper towels. I mean, uh, I, I take was the chicken cryvac? Was it in a bag? Was oh yeah, a lot no, of juice no, I did there? that. I did that. I washed it and like towelled it off yeah, and yeah. everything. But um, you know how she likes to let stuff sit in the yeah, fridge, let open it pel air, and, form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It certainly you wouldn't hurt. That. Yeah, but uh, the the salt will, you know, sort of lock the moisture in. It'll yeah. be fun. Yeah, it's gonna be great. And the cool thing about cooking a chicken that way is, I'm used to like roasting a chicken and then after having the roasted chicken, using the bones to make stock. But yeah. I made stock yesterday. Nice. And I'm going to eat the chicken a day later, which is uh, just totally turned things on. It's amazing. On, and are, are you going to grill it or are you going to cook it in a pan? I'm going to cook it in a pan. It, it yeah. works fine. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, it's a good recipe. You know, the the book uh, is about, I never, I never, I've been cooking 35 years and never really had a huge desire to write a cookbook. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried a couple of times um, and found that I really wanted to be in the kitchen cooking. I didn't want to be sitting at a desk trying to pull things out of my, my yeah. thick skull. Um, so I, I failed three times. And then finally, at this point in my life, you know, we have nine properties, but the publican went from being a restaurant that was based on a singular soundbite, oysters, pork, and beer. That was mm -hmm. the idea. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you guys want to? This is my me talking to my business partners. Do you guys mm -hmm. want to open up a restaurant that's all about oysters, pork, and beer? And, and who's going to say no? Yeah, I'd say yeah. that to chefs, and they'd be yeah. like, "Are you kidding me? It's yeah. the best idea ever." Yeah. And then just 
what we created uh, expanded to a butcher shop across the street uh-huh. um, and then an organic bakery around the corner. And that's oh, wow. sort of what the book is about. It's yeah. it's about the producers. It's about all the people that make the restaurant great and really not about myself and the co-author Cosmo. Um, so it worked out pretty good. We're, we're very proud of it. Yeah, it's good. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, the 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 fish with the potato chip crust. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was, that's <laughs> something I would like to try. Yeah, uh, that was a, I, a Minnesota buddy. Uh, eating at Blackbird with uh, uh, one of his fishing buddies, and he said, "You know what? I do for shore lunch. I crumble up a bag of salt and vinegar, potato chips, and coat the fish with that." And yeah, that uh, sounds pretty great. Pretty much immediately, mm-hmm. there was a recipe on the menu with that. And then you break a rule by serving like seafood with cheese, which isn't that sort of like breaking a rule? You know, there's there's a guy that <laughs> that uh, broke that rule very successfully named Eric Repair. Oh, he did. Um, oh, yeah, uh, several times. Oh, uh, he loves oh. like tuna and parmesan. And oh, really? Yeah, okay. I, I think it works pretty well. Yeah. I, I know that rule, and I, I I abode abode. Is that right? I abide, abide by, by it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In your abode. Um, yeah, but uh, who, who cares if it, if it works? It works. No, I I'm dying to try that. So, so hey, well, well, not not to change the subject, but um, what what was the first concert you can ever remember seeing? Uh, first concert seeing was Aerosmith. Oh, nice. Yeah, for me it was uh, Ted Nugent on the Ted Nugent tour. I, that was my second concert. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty With much Ted the same Nugent age. and Golden Earring. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, they had Golden Earring had that song "Radar Love." Oh yeah, of course. and uh, they played that. That was the last song they played. They were opening up for Ted Nugent uh, at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. And at the end of "Radar Love," when the drummer hits the last beat of it, his uh, his throne, his seat, uh, was an ejection seat, and he flew through the air. And landed like on the front of the stage, in like a you know like Olga Corbett or something. And then you got to be kidding me. Threw his drumsticks out to the audience. That's uh, re- re- was like, wow. That's ready, Steve, yeah. Andy. All right, fellows, let's go. <laughs> yeah. That's is it, Steve yeah. and Andy? Is that what they say in the oh, beginning yeah, of Radar Love? Y- uh, oh uh, no, that's uh, what was that in the beginning of that? Or is that Radar Love or is that a sweet song? I'm getting them confused, but uh, oh yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. ready, Steve, Andy. All right, fellas, let's go. It's Radar Love. That's yeah. Ballroom Blitz. Oh, you're right. Ballroom <laughs> Blitz, good. You know your stuff. Well, barely. Yeah. Um, um, suffering from cocktail Heimer's disease. Uh, so. Yeah, I have the same disease. <laughs> and, and and so uh, how, how did you start playing music? How did that go? Well, um, yeah, I mean, pretty much every band I've been in has sort of been an extension of uh, like social, my social life, friends, I've been playing with friends and the first uh the first band was uh, some people I ended up uh, a band called Dust Devils and uh they were already a um a band they had um a cop started by a couple that moved here from England and uh to New York and um we were just into the same music I saw them at at shows mm-hmm. uh over and over again and at that time that was like uh mid 80s I guess um the scene in New York was a little. It was. It, it seemed smaller. You know. You would see this. I would see the same people yeah. at shows uh, once a week. You know. Yeah. And uh, also, bands were more accessible. Like if you saw a band playing, you'd end up talking to them afterwards, yeah. like or hanging out um, uh, in in a lot of cases. And uh, so I got to know these guys, and they asked me one night um, after I think I'd had a few drinks. They asked if I played bass, and I had literally just picked up a bass at a friend's house. <laughs> Um, a couple of days earlier, and I said, "Yeah, yeah." And then they called me the next day and said, "Well, we, you know, we need a bass player." So, and I was like, "Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I said that. I, I really, literally have j- just picked up a bass." <laughs> and they were like, "Okay, uh, well, you know, we'll see you around." And uh, but then they called back again and said, "Why don't we just try this?" And they gave me a bass, and um, that's sort of how I started what, doing. What kind it. of bass did they give you? Uh, gosh, I don't even know what it was. It was a real beater. I know that. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, court, I ended up. I ended a court? up. I had, <laughs> <laughs> that's a beater, right? That's Sorry, a cool, court. Yeah. Sorry, I, court. I wish it was. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I didn't really even use it for very long. I think I ended up being so psyched that they were pleased with what I had done in their in their practice space yeah. that I went out and uh, I bought a like a Fender. Kind of precision. Uh, preci- it was a yeah. It was like a one of those active pickup like '80s Fender Precisions. I bought one from a friend, 
and uh, had that for a while. Speaking of, I've act- only had two bases. Speaking of active pickups, I was uh, uh, when I was in college, I I studied math and computer science, believe it or not, but uh, I. I Got a job working at a summer camp in upstate New York, and it was a performing arts camp. I taught judo and computer science. But anyways, yeah, uh, cool. we, would, we would come into the city every couple couple weeks, mm-hmm. and uh, I was with this guy who played French horn in uh, one of the New York symphonies or chamber, some some group, and we were uh, in Washington Square Park for all the wrong reasons, um, looking to have some fun. Mm-hmm. And he goes, he yells out, hey, Jocko! And I'm like, oh, holy cow, is that Jaco Pastorius? And so we ended up and ended up spending an afternoon with Jaco Pastorius. Oh, crazy! Like six months before he died. Whoa, doing um, what? Uh, well, we went to a bodega and got some big bottles of beer and sat in the park and drank beer and walked around and it was pretty. I, I, I was definitely a fan. Wow! So kind of blew, kind of speaking of active electronics, that was him and Stanley Clark were the big active. Oh, actually, I didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, maybe, maybe one of them even invented it, or maybe Stanley Clark did. Huh. You know, that real that real bent, weird, doesn't even really sound like a bass sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it sounds like a harmonic a little bit. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. You would know better than I would, but. What, is that sort of what led up to the, like, um, Seinfeld bass or whatever? Is it, the sound? Oh, the. Is, it, is that Seinfeld? That, well, I mean, that's a, a type exactly. of playing, but, like. Exactly. That's probably oh, on an active pickup. Yeah. Uh, um, that, that's exactly the sound. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of one of the things I, I've always been like a, a gear junkie. Like when I go to shows, I'm my, my wife's like, "What are you doing? I, I got to go up to the front and watch them change the equipment over from one band to the next." Uh-huh. Just I don't know. Just I'm just really interested in all, all the gear and stuff and how it uh-huh. sounds differently. Yeah, that's cool. I, I I mean, I wish I knew more about gear, but. Um, I can I can see I mean like pedals are, are something I could see you getting very very uh, yep. into and um, do well, you, uh, do you play an instrument or uh, you know I I, I I I haven't in a long time but I, I did play the drums mm-hmm. in a couple bands oh. growing up kind of a, kind of a pounder uh huh yeah <laughs> uh, no, I'm not I guess I'm I'm okay uh-huh. my my wife and I had a, a scheme at one point to start our own band we were going to call it old uh-huh. and it was just going to be drums and bass and. She plays bass a little bit. Hmm. For her for her fiftieth birthday, she's fifty eight now. I got her a, a nineteen sixty six Fender Precision bass and a Hammond B three flip top. Wow, speaker still have them both. Yeah, it's a really great sounding bass speaker. Huh. <laughs> wow, that sounds great. Have you ever played through one of those or no? Uh, no, not a B three speaker. No. Um, but is that it, just made me think. Isn't there like a place in Chicago that it specializes in restoring that stuff and those uh, Hammond keyboards and things? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's it's oh, oh, Ampeg B three. That's what it is. Did oh, I say Ampeg. Hammond. Oh yeah. Duh, sorry. Ampeg. I know. I know that the flip top. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. I had one of those. Yeah. Nice. Very briefly, but uh, yeah. Nice. Those are great. They really look cool on um, stage. So, so what what years did you play with Sonic Youth? Uh, not. I'm not really sure when I would have started, maybe 2004 to like when they finished or so, stopped so, playing. So, uh, so I, I must have seen you. Probably like about six years. I must have seen you play at Pitchfork in Chicago when they, they played the whole Daydream Nation album from start to finish on yeah, day and one you know on Friday. Um, they, I was playing with them then, but uh, for that, uh, they played Daydream Nation as the original lineup. And oh. then for encores, we would play the more recent songs, and I would come out and play on those. Oh. So, so those were really easy shows. I would just wa- get to watch them play those songs. And that, then, that was a very yeah. memorable show for me. I yeah. enjoyed it immensely, even though you didn't play the whole time. Oh yeah, no, I I, I was happily watching <laughs> also. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So what about um, have you been working in restaurants since you were little? Like I, I started working in restaurants when I was sixteen. I, you, you know, my my uh, dad uh, had a delicatessen in Chicago when I was growing up, a Jewish mm-hmm. deli. So I spent time there, and then um, you know cooked a lot at home. Um, started when I was a kid. I got really interested in making bread. Oh, um, and something I've never really been that great at. I, I got off on the wrong, the wrong foot a little bit. I, I uh, went to college for math and computer science because I thought I should, and I was not, not a very good student. Um, partied a lot in college. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, one of my things, the, the reason why I have a giant record collection is because after I would take a test, I would be ridden with such guilt because I did so poorly that I would go buy records every time yeah. to make myself feel better. Yeah. And there were some great record stores where I went to school, so I would just 
buy a shit ton of records and I, I, I still do to this day. So yeah. I've, been, I've been buying records for 40, 40 or 50 years, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 55. Oh, wow. So since I was about 15. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and at a certain point I just thought, uh, I think I, I think I want to be a chef. And I remember telling my dad, uh, I was working at his smoke fish factory uh, at the time. And he, he said, you know, you just went to school for five years. I think you're crazy, but I'll support you in whatever oh, you, you did. You did do five years of uh, I was on the, math the, and computer yeah, science? Yeah, the yeah. five-year plan. I graduated. Yeah, uh, believe I it or not. <laughs> I went in as a physics major and then just was like, uh, I took like all my math classes, but um, then just started veering off and taking language classes and uh, art stuff and then... It was sort of the same thing. It was buying records and not part of doing very bit. well, <laughs> chasing girls. Yeah, um, but but you know, I I, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, when I was done with school, I met, I met my wife, and she had a friend that was a pastry chef in a restaurant, and mm-hmm. I started as a prep cook and never looked back, and uh, I just wanted to learn everything, everything that I touched. You know, and tasted, and it was a really good kitchen because. Where was this? Uh, it was in Chicago. It was yeah. a little, little neighborhood place called Metropolis Cafe, mm-hmm. and there were some really great cooks uh, that worked there that came out of that kitchen, and it's it, it was different than restaurants now. I mean, you mm-hmm. actually cook food and taste food, and mm-hmm. we would change the menu a lot. And so I, just you know, and, and basically any culture that you wanted, if you wanted to make you know a homemade cannelloni. Make it, try it. Mm-hmm. Let's see if it ends up on the menu. And so it was, well, they would do that kind of stuff. So that's pretty. Yeah, we would do it. We would do everything. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, and so I, I learned, uh, you know, through trial and error, mm-hmm. uh, through books, mm-hmm. um, and and like I said, have kind of never looked back. There's uh-huh. there's definitely a certain amount of there's been a certain amount of luck uh, in my career. You know, kind of right uh-huh. place at the right time. Yeah. Well. But yeah. Join the so club. I'm looking at myself in the mirror. <laughs> 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 but um. Yeah, and, and you know, at a certain point in my in my career, I didn't want to work uh, work for someone anymore. I was tired of it, um, and you know, met a guy who was a customer in a restaurant where I was the chef, and he loved what I did, and he had signed a lease for a space, um, and the rest is kind of history for me. Mm-hmm. And so that was Blackbird, and we're about to have our twentieth anniversary there. Oh wow, December first. So knock on wood, we're we're still going strong with nine, and then we're going to open we're opening two more places this year, and. And then, so how do you manage that? I mean, in New York, it seems like that. Um, you know, I, I work in a restaurant that is, you know, in a neighborhood that's changing so much, and uh, you know, it, the, the the restaurant business here seems like it's really intense. You know, especially with real real estate yeah. um, prices. And uh, is is that the same in Chicago? Or are you able to? It's it's um, the same. Yeah, it's the same. I I, I think you know uh, I'm fortunate to have a really great partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, we started with four guys and really, um, those four guys are still, we're still working together. Uh-huh. I and mean, it's only been a couple times where I've had my hands around the throat of one of them on the ground, mm-hmm. shaking them like I wanted to kill them. But what do they do? What, what do the partners do? Are they like, uh, uh they, 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 they each have a sort of a different area of focus. One mm-hmm. guy is, uh, uh, all about the, the wine and spirits. Another guy, um, runs the first two restaurants. The, the partnership has changed up a little bit, but there mm-hmm. are constants throughout all of the restaurants. So mm-hmm. everyone works. There's no mm-hmm. one that just sits around and counts the money, mm-hmm. um, which that's that probably that doesn't really happen so much, but sit I, around and count the money. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's cool that everyone's working and it probably is part of what helps make the whole thing. Yeah, uh, yeah I, th- I think at this point the... Funnest part is conceptualizing new restaurants. We we just do um, every one of them. We we do it because we're passionate about it. Like mm-hmm. uh, you haven't been to Chicago recently enough, but we have a place called Big Star, and yes, it is named after. Uh, we were looking at a stack I went there. of records. Oh, you went to Big Star. Yeah, nice. I, I, I could have been there. Right about uh, it, it, is it almost ten years old? I, I think that's that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Eight years old, maybe nine. Yeah, I think I went there in two thousand ten. Okay. Yeah, a lot, a lot of rock and roll guys end up there, but that that was sort of about. Uh, um, it's true. Uh, that was sort of about. Uh, my wife and I used to have these parties, and I had these old Klipsch hearsay speakers. I don't know if you know those. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're nice. They're loud speakers. You know, paper cone. Yeah. And I would drag those speakers out in the yard and play records for the parties, and the the parties grew, and um, you know. It just had the, the those speakers had this certain sound that I just loved, and it reminded me of an old man bar. Uh-huh. And so we we found this space, which was an old gas station, and um, the idea was um, my business partner Terry says that it was 
my idea to serve tacos, I worked for Rick Bayless. I was the uh, chef de cuisine at Topolo Bampo at his fine dining Mexican oh, wow. restaurant in Chicago. But I, I, I sort of walked past Mexican food and never looked back. And we got mm-hmm. this old gas station. Terry says it was my idea to do tacos. And I think it was, I think I wanted to do greasy burgers and he wanted to do tacos. But at any rate, the music became just as important, maybe more important than the food. Hmm. Um, and so we were like, you know, this says who I am. It was like, we were trying to figure out a way that we could smash whiskey into tequila. Like where, where um, geographically or historically do those two things meet? And we came up with uh, Bakersfield, California. Um, you know, migrant workers coming up from Mexico to work in the fields, most fertile place in America. And then there was the the outlaw country uh, scene started in Bakersfield with uh-huh. Buck Owens and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Merle and all those guys. And so... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so. there's, there's some really cool record labels that, that came out of Bakersfield. Um, and so that that's kind of where that that idea was born and uh, we have a record player and we have tons of music guys that, that work at that restaurant. And, mm-hmm. the, you know, for, for years they've been just going out and, you know, following every little record label and nook and cranny. And mm-hmm. you can go in there and then, e- even a guy like yourself, you'd sit in the bar in there and go like, who, who is this? This is incredible. And it's some weird, might be some weird Nashville or some weird Bakersfield mm-hmm. country guy. And they go, they go on tangents, you know, they'll go, you know, Rolling Stones, they'll go, you know, the play Exile on Main Street mm-hmm. or whatever makes sense. There's really no rules, but it's just sort of music that's all rooted mm-hmm. rooted in that. And Do you ever go into one of the places and hear some music that you don't like and think like, why are they playing this? Or? Actually, my, my, my business partner and I, Terry, we have meetings. Okay. And the, those meetings are where we go get drunk together and talk about maybe new ideas or just maybe nonsense. Uh-huh. But we, we often go in and are like, they, they can't play this. This isn't right. Yeah. And the next day we usually I, have it. I feel like I hear inappropriate music in yeah. re- in restaurants all the time. I think I might overreact to that a little bit, but yeah. um, just coming from like going to restaurant in, in restaurants in Europe where there's no music playing. Yeah. And I feel, sometimes I, I feel like uh, they can get in the way of, you know, or weird music can get in the way of like having a good meal. Yeah, you know, um, I, I struggle with the, the the sound systems in in our restaurants. Some are really good and some maybe leave a little bit to be desired. Sorry, mm-hmm. guys that installed the sound systems. But mm-hmm. that, that's a part of it too. Sometimes the music's just too forward and in my ears too much and it, it really does affect uh, affect the meal. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear gangster rap when I'm, when I'm having dinner, it just doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't work for me personally. But yeah, I mean, I don't really want to hear Pavement or Sonic Youth when I'm having dinner. Yeah, <laughs> personally. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, I, it, that's sort of a funny thing where I work at the Jones because uh, it's a place that has traditionally had a lot of people that have really been super interested in music working there, and uh, there was a guy that put together this incredible jukebox for for years and years and years, and. Uh, I find when I go there, I just, uh, I don't even play my own music. I just play um, old timey jazz music. That's because cool. I feel like that in the background is like kind of a nice thing. It doesn't really interfere with anything. Like, like old timey, like and, like Bill Brunsey or something, like New Orleans jazz? Or? Oh yeah, like all kinds of old, I, I don't even know what a lot of it is. A lot of it, uh, the, uh, the guy that uh, used to uh, put the jukebox together, put it all on an iPod and I just put it on on jazz. And I also find that when I listen to that, there's not, uh, since I don't know, jazz uh-huh. uh, very well that I don't really um, like it all sounds good to me you know uh-huh. uh, I don't really find anything objectionable so you, you, know? you like, never like, like, uh, like foc- focus on a particular jazz bass player uh, no never. no I don't I, I, I listen to to whole whole bands I don't really listen to specific instruments that much you know yeah. Uh, unless something's really out there and standing out you know but yeah. I find that happens more with vocals I guess uh, than uh, really for me um, yeah. uh, but uh, just yeah, you, I think th- it's th- a funny this conversation thing, like, makes me think of choose. Charlie Mingus. Yeah, <laughs> like that. I mean, that guy. I mean, he's like a genius. Like the bass is like vocals. Oh yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but you're, you're you're a bass player. I'm not. So yeah, um, but I, yeah, I, I listen. I, but I don't really. I, I really don't listen for bass. I listen to everything. Nice. You know? um, and uh, do you remember uh, uh, song titles? No, I'm terrible. Album titles? Terrible. See, it's like I'm looking in the mirror. It's like I can't remember song titles. Like I had to, I was like, oh, I wonder if I, I wonder if he's going to ask me about any Pavement or Sonic Youth 
questions, like just you know, in conversation. Are you familiar with the song that <laughs> yeah, I, right. and I, I used and to I, perform? I was uh, like, oh, I was like, oh, Crooked Rain. Like I remember, like when I looked it up, looking at that album cover for so long, but I, I don't remember the title of the songs or of the album or anything. Yeah, oh, yeah me neither. I don't. I, I you know, I, a lot of times, I yeah, it's terrible. It's embarrassing, actually. Yeah. I, so. Um, but do, do, do you know any Chicago bass players that you like? Chicago bass players? Uh-huh. Uh, geez, again, you know, I... <laughs> Sorry, let's I'm change sure, the subject. I'm sure that, uh, well, how about Dave Sims? But he's not really from Chicago. I think he's from Texas. But he was in the band The Jesus Lizard. Oh, yeah. Uh, who are actually, I think, about to do some shows again. Have you, did you ever see them live? I, I, I did. It's like one of the best all-time uh, live bands. I almost bands got spit on. No, I'm... <laughs> Well, you're lucky it was spit. There, there was a lot of standing on uh, <laughs> standing on the monitor, yeah. uh, wafting hawkers into the crowd. And oh, I was, yeah, yeah. I was up near the yeah. front, so yeah, uh, that was unfortunate. I wonder, uh, yeah, what those shows are going to be like. But I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that. But I th- I thought that guy was a great bass player. But I like I I mean honestly, I really don't, don't know. pay attention to specific playing. I I kind of get into the whole. Show yeah, I, I was and, only asking because um, one of my favorite Chicago bands of all time was this band called Eleventh Dream Day. Oh yeah, Do you remember yeah. those guys? Yeah, yeah. Doug McCombs is the bass player, and I, I just, I just love his his sound. Yeah. Now I I can't isolate that right now, but I remember really liking that band. Really and, good uh, band. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So you want to talk more about food? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what do you like to cook besides? Uh, I know you're making this chicken. Do you just? I go through phases, you yeah. know, it's like, uh, actually in a way it's like listening to music, you know, I, I don't have, like somebody will say like, what's your favorite thing to cook? I'll be like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, like, well, I, it's like, it's why I probably don't, I never got a tattoo, you know, I like images and I can't imagine you know, having the same, having the same one all the time. I'd be like looking at, uh, listening to the same record every day, you yeah. know, I go through phases. So with cooking, uh, yeah, I mean, I will have like a, uh, at a given time, like maybe for like a period of like a year, like a cookbook that I, uh, I refer to. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so do you, do I remember you, that Judy, that, uh, Judy Zuni, Rogers cookbook, the Zuni yeah. book was one of those that lasted for quite a long time. Very, and, um, that was a very influential book for me as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, um, I just cook all kinds of stuff, you know, nice. uh, I, I fall for trends, you know, like right now I would say that like, um, I'm a little more interested in doing stuff that's uh, not as meaty, okay. um, which I think is a trend right now. Uh, I'd uh, say at least so. in New York, it is. Uh, we have like this amazing. Have you ever been to Superiority Burger? Yep. Um, yeah, I know. I know Brooks. Uh, so ex rock and roll. You know, guy. I think what he's doing is like awesome. fantastic. Yeah. yeah he and, did a pop up uh, at Big Star. He oh he did. came and served when his book came out. Um, he came and no after after the book. Sorry, or maybe they were. I, I don't remember. Oh, the but, dessert book. Yeah, but, okay. but but he served his veggie burger when the dessert book came out. Maybe oh, it was did. a precursor cool. to the superiority burger. Yeah. He's a cool dude. Yeah, I mean, I feel like New Yorkers are really lucky to be able to go into a place like that and uh, get such great quality stuff. Just sort of hand it to them over a counter for, you know, uh, 20 bucks. You can have like a really nice array of things. And, nice. Uh, I think, I think uh, we're already in the backlash, backlash phase of that the, type of food? No, to, oh. to, I think the, the backlash to vegetables is starting to happen. Oh yeah, you know, like we you said, oh yeah, the healthy eating vegetable yeah. phase. Yeah. yeah, I think we're I think it's almost full circle. Oh really? Yeah, like I mean, everyone. What? So many people come up to me and they say, uh, you know, I haven't been to the public and I, I I'm not a real big meat eater. And we we the biggest carrots section, are the biggest, aren't you? Yeah, the, the biggest carrots like yeah, a really yeah. big thing. Yeah, one of the biggest. It's the biggest section in the book, the vegetable section, yeah. and it's probably the I biggest that, section that, you, on the, that leads off. That that's the beginning of the book, really. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and and it's it's probably the biggest section on the menu. Um, you know, the menu's divided into three parts: vegetables, uh, seafood, you know, fish and seafood, and and meat. Mm-hmm. And they both sides of the menu lead off with things that we just get. Like one side is oysters, the other side is artisanal hams from all around the world. Mm-hmm. So we just get it and slice it or get it in pot and boat and, and serve them, you know, like zero manipulation items. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the vegetables have really, you know, when we started, uh, maybe it was three vegetable items, and now I think there's just at least 10 every night mm-hmm. on the menu. And it's, you know, creative stuff, seasonal stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, And those are probably the easiest recipes in the book as well. Oh, yeah? So, yeah. 
So, man, I hope I hope it uh, comes close to that Judy Rogers slot. That would that would be incredible. There's a there's oh, yeah. a, there's a lot to work through in there. Yeah, I like that. Um, the um, I haven't been to his restaurant in a while, but uh, Jonathan Waxman. Um, the is Barbuda still open? Oh you yeah. yeah. Um, I just went out to dinner with him yesterday. Oh, you did? I did. He's good that, that potato recipe looks pretty good. <laughs> like really, <laughs> synth- potatoes cooked three times, basically. Yeah, um, that seems pretty great. One of our cooks uh, asked the question once: Where do you keep the Waxman potatoes? Like they thought the variety of potato was the Waxman potato, oh, not how we actually that would be a good cook name them. for a potato. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's. Uh, I think he's one of the greatest, uh, like simple, straightforward food guys around period. Mm-hmm. Like he, there's just no, no time for shenanigans. I'm mm-hmm. um, like his chicken recipe. It's I'm like, Jonathan, what's the secret? It's a great chicken and it's salt and pepper mm-hmm. and, you know, basting, basting the bird with a lot of the fat that it generates as you mm. cook it. But that's it. Nothing more to it. Mm. And it's honestly, I don't know if it's quite as good as the publican chicken, but it's a good chicken. Well, we'll we shall see tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to get some espalette though. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of forget. Is that like related to paprika, or is it kind of like? Um, well, it's it's related in that it's chili pepper, but it's uh, it's from the the Basque region, which is where's the Basque region? Is it the northern? Yeah, sort of near the French border. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is the chilies are super wet, um, and it's just they're just dried in the sun and then ground mm-hmm. uh, a little on the coarse side. It's it's uh, uh, Appalachian origin control, so it's controlled very tightly mm-hmm. by the mm-hmm. government. Um, but it's it's just a variety. It's like, have you ever had Urfa pepper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you, you know about this uh, spice shop in New York called Le Boite? I know of it. Um, I haven't been You've there. You've read though. about it? Yeah. Got to get some of that shit. It it's insane. Yeah, we, Lior's a good friend, the guy that owns it. We yeah. did some consulting work together, but uh, you want to make, you know, you, you'll impress your friends and neighbors with uh, with spices. The stuff's so, yeah. so delicious. Like he does one called Cancal. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, the, the name of a town in uh, Brittany, mm-hmm. and it's sort of the flavors of Ken Cal. So it's uh, beautiful salt with uh, fennel seed, fennel pollen, orange, uh, very subtle. Mm-hmm. I, I use it on just about everything: Me- wow. meat, fish. It's outrageous. yeah, it's funny. I, I kind of um, steer away from people's spice mixes, but it sounds like his are really great. Yeah, you know, I, I, I hate spice mixes too, but his are. You know, he has one that's called Mish Mish. We actually do a recipe with it in the book, and it's um, a spice mix that's supposed to emulate the flavor of an apricot. Oh, so freaky. it's like saffron, crystallized honey, uh, just stuff that you wouldn't expect. Uh-huh. And his spice blends are, there's one called Pure Poivre. It's just a collection of different kinds of peppercorns. Mm. Um, but he gets the highest quality stuff and well, treats what, yeah. it really well. Um, you can get singular spices there, but it's it's a... Uh, it's like in Hell's Kitchen. I would yeah, stop no. in. It's have you ever been to this one in uh, Paris called uh, Tier Salin? No. Um, it's like a really old spice shop in Paris, oh. and they make some mixes. I bought their like their like Razel Hanoud is a really great, nice. uh, pretty exotic version of that. Um, and uh, they have their own. Um, I think they have their own saffron fields in Iran. Wow. So they were kind of known for saffron and. Um, Sort of exotics like vanilla and stuff, mm-hmm. but it's pretty cool place because it's really old and uh, it's yeah. been there for a long you time. You know, uh, Lior got his <laughs> he got his jam from uh, this chef named Olivia Rollinger. You ever heard that name before? No. Uh, amazing guy. Like if you look up the name and read his story, he was a, a businessman of some sort uh, in um, Saint Malo in France, uh-huh. yeah, uh, which I That's believe is cool in town. Brittany. Yeah. It's a cool town. Yeah, and uh, he got jumped and uh, nearly beaten to death. And I know it's horrible. It sounds horrible, but he he convalesced, and as he was convalescing, he decided that he was going to change his career and he was going to sort of follow his dream to be a chef. Mm-hmm. And I was fortunate enough. Lior set me up because Lior did his externship. Uh, one of the few people that's ever really studied spice blending with this guy. Um, he set me up to have breakfast with him at his uh, his restaurant. He actually, when he got three Michelin stars, he closed his restaurant. But he's this very much the spice chef. The ideas of his food sort of follow spice roots. And I sat down to breakfast with this guy, and he was like looking over the horizon and talking about where cinnamon comes from and where you know the origins of spice and culture. And super fascinating huh. man. And um, so the, there, there's a lot more to it than hey, I want to make something for steak and throwing a bunch of crap together. Yeah. This guy's like, I think that there's a sourcing thing going on over there too. That, yeah. that in um, I just noticed like when you when you have like cumin in a restaurant in Paris, it has like more of a 
or I, I don't know. And I don't know if that means that we're just getting cumin that's been sitting in warehouses for a long time. Uh, age or, is super important. Like um, fresh spices make a big difference. But uh, or if it's just that they have different suppliers, and because I'd love to learn about that, you know, like where to get. Because I love cumin, I would like to know where the best cumin comes from. But he, does maybe this? Uh, he's your guy. Are, yeah, he is. Okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get a kick out of going there. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, Brooks uh, uses some of that guy's stuff too. I think he does. Yeah. A, a lot, a lot of the big, the big names do. Like he does stuff for Eric Repair and for uh-huh. Danielle, and does a lot of stuff for that Paul Kahn guy in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that's another thing I noticed from your book that you get a lot of. Um, and how does a restaurant afford to like get? I mean, oysters from. It's more like how do we not afford? To get them is is the question. Yeah, um, you know, never really fancied myself as being a spectacular cook. I, I'm I've gardened for a large part of my life, and when you go out in the yard and you pick, you know, teeny little leaves or this, that, or the other thing, or you know, fresh vegetables out of your garden it makes all the difference in the world. So um, I, I feel like uh, sourcing and those relationships are are really important to us. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, really, it's it's more like, how do we not afford it? I mean, yeah, we, we might get these uh, persimmons from, chocolate persimmons from Penryn Orchard, and we profile the the man that we get those persimmons from, mm-hmm. um, and and you put them on a plate, and they're just, they're transcending. They're just yeah. incredible. Um, and so it just works in the equation for that restaurant. I mean, we're, we're busy. It's a big restaurant. It's really busy. Mm-hmm. We've transitioned to almost all organic produce there, really mm-hmm. because... Um, I think it's better for the earth and it, it tastes better. Um, but but ultimately, um, we just try to run a really tight business and be really smart. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the book uh, is really about the fact that we have all these, we have this network set up and on a, diff- on a different day, we'll get different things. So, you know, twice a week we get seafood from Monterey Bay. We, we don't get, I mean, a good answer to your question is we don't, we don't get a uh, number one center cut loin of tuna. We get sand dabs, which people unless you're from San Francisco, they think it's a garbage fish. Yeah, and they're amongst the most delicious things I've ever had. Um, you know, we, we get all the oily fish, you know, kind of harking back to old times. You know, we mm-hmm. love mackerel and we love uh, sardines and all those things. Mm-hmm. And those, they're really cheap. You know, by the time mm-hmm. the sardines get harvested or uh, caught, uh, they go through a middleman and they come to Chicago. They're more expensive than if we get them and add on the shipping uh, from our sources in California and on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. So it's really not as uh, tricky as you think. Mm-hmm. Um, the the middle guys take a huge markup. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I would just think that it would be you know hard to maintain that or to. I guess you have to. I mean, it's tough it in the winter, man. Things and, expensive. And, 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 and I think there's a part in the book where I talk about that in the winter time, all our, our food is kind of piles of brown stuff. Uh-huh. Um, cause there's not a lot that's fresh and although the, the, those windows have been steadily expanding, you know, like we have guys in Southern Illinois that grow in hoop houses so we can get great, great thing, get mm-hmm. great things all year. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going up to Montreal and, uh, going into the basement of, uh, Joe beef and they had all these little grow lights and yep. like they're growing all their microgreens. I mean, this was a pretty long time ago. Like you sure they, like they probably pulled some trays of microgreens out and hid their weed. <laughs> 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 Um, Those guys are great guys too. That's a special place. Oh boy, is it? Yeah. Um, I've had some really great times there. Yeah, um, epic meals. Oh, that's a good food. Do you get to travel and and eat? I, I, and- I, I do. A little less less now that I'm getting a little bit older. I don't really uh, so much have the patience. But there was a ten year, you know window there where I just traveled all over the place to cook at events. I used to go to the Festival Lumiere, um, which is this uh, winter food festival in Montreal. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're a hearty sort, man. They're yeah. like out partying mm-hmm. around bonfires. and It's the coldest place I've ever been. It's really, it's a different kind of cold. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I Montreal is one of my favorite food cities in the whole world and have been there many times to cook and to yeah. eat and to just hang out. Yeah, there's all kinds of great stuff there. Oh, you even mentioned that the chicken yeah, is that was a, sort of based on a, one of those Portuguese chicken places in yeah, Montreal. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah my, my business partner and I walked in a place on a corner. I, I forget the name of it. Uh, sat there, and the guy was literally smoking a cigarette, cooking chickens on a grill. That's and amazing. They were spatchcocked, and uh, you know, I asked him, hey, what, what, what's in this recipe? Because it was delicious. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, you know, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. Yeah. You know, that, that, that line. But um, I went back home and started working on uh, sort of my version of that, and I think it's better than the chicken shack. But I, I, I rarely have moments of 
cockiness, but the people people really love that chicken. So yeah, well, I'm gonna try it tonight. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna try it T- tonight. Can you? You got it. You salt it and then you marinate it the next day. Uh, yeah. Well, you know what? I should. What I should have done was I should have marinated it this morning. This morning. Um, You'll be fine. But three or four uh, hours is good. Yeah, I mean. I, sh- get, I should be able to pull it off. Did you get a good bird or just an average Joe chicken? I got a Dartanian well, organic a good chicken. Sure. Um, from the co-op. I'm a member of the Park Slope Food Co-op. Nice. Um, which uh, is, I have mixed feelings about, but... How um, many years have I you lived get, in New York? I've lived here since 83. Wow. Um, and mostly in Manhattan. And then like around uh, 2000, like in the mid 2000s, I moved... To Queens, so what, and now I live in Brooklyn. So. You said you were hanging out at at, at bars, seeing music uh, in in the eighties. What, what were the what were the places you hung out at in the eighties? See bands, um, CBGBs, CBGBs, of course. Yeah. Which uh, you know, in some ways, was very overrated. But for like the wrong, I mean, they had some great shows there, mm-hmm. but they also had a lot of terrible shows there. Yeah. And uh, uh, I would, but I, you know, there for a while there, they were having. Um, they had a really good run. Um, I mean, I'm sort of of the second CBGB's generation, I would say. We're not, we're, I don't know if you would call it a generation, but um, I missed out on the- Like tail end of the Ramones? I missed out on that period, yeah, yeah television and whatever. But um, uh, that sort of early like indie rock time, uh, they had some, you know, they would have a, a good show there almost once a week and they had a great sound system. So nice. uh, it was good, very loud, but uh, really good sounding. Um, where else? Um, I don't know. Um, there was, uh, yeah, then there were sort of like some l- somewhat larger places like the Ritz. Uh, Maxwell's I mean, it is the place yep. that yep. was really the best. Um, yep. um, they, they had super consistent uh, booking and good, uh, good bands playing there all the time. What was the place in Hoboken? That's Maxwell's. Maxwell's, yeah. yeah. Um, and there was a great record store there, so uh, my friends and I would go record shopping there twice a week. It's, That's it's, where it's, I got turned on to Australia, Australian and New Zealand stuff, like in the mid oh, 80s, nice. like the clean and yeah. the chills and stuff. And um, and then we would go to Maxwell's. You know? Wow. Um, and how, how many years ago did Maxwell's close? Fairly recently, right? I th- um, unsure? Somebody says it's, it is actually still open. Oh, it's still open? Yeah. Um, maybe not at, yeah, do they still have shows there? Yeah, huh. that's kind of cool. What was, so, the, what was the guy's name that owned it? Steve Fallon is the guy that I kind of remember. Kind of a short, chubby-ish guy? Possibly. Maybe balding at this point? Yeah, this possibly. Is, this is interesting radio. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's balding at this point. <laughs> You're um, doing pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I went to see the, maybe it was f- four or five years ago, I went to see the one of the Hanukkah shows that Yola Tango does. Oh yeah, those that were there. Those were great. Yeah. And I thought someone told me they were closing, but what do yeah. I know? Was it with comedy? Was there a comedy opening? Or there was, was it a, a comedy band? opening. Yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah. Huh. I, I think the night before the Feelies opened up, and uh, wow, I, I sure missed out. Yeah. I mean, the comedy was good, but it wasn't the Feelies. Yeah. Which I saw them this year at uh, Pitchfork. Uh huh. And it's like an interesting syndrome. Uh, they're they're older and. Uh-huh. I think the Meat Puppets are a little older. I, this year I saw the Meat Puppets and the Feelies both at outdoor festivals. And the first three songs were so bad. I was like, oh my God, I feel so bad for these guys. But then their, their joints must get warmed up because <laughs> both of them, the, the Meat Puppets uh, played a song off Meat Puppets 2, which I love that album. Mm-hmm. I think it was, it's like a, you know, it's a great it's real country. Yeah, yeah. But, and then they went into this, they just went insane and it was an incredible show. Oh, that's great. And the same thing, man, by the time the feelies were done, I, they, they played a medley of all the songs off or most of the songs off their first album, Crazy Rhythms, mm-hmm. that, that lightning fast, it's mm-hmm. just insane. Mm-hmm. And they, they they didn't miss a beat. I, wow. I was My jaw was to the ground. It was yeah, amazing. Yeah, I haven't seen recent shows by those bands, but uh, um, I've heard good stuff about it. Yeah. yeah, they were both like regular bands at Maxwell's. They, yeah. they would constantly show up there. Yeah, and actually the feelies, they're, they're, as their albums come out, they're, they're really good. New still, ones? Yeah, new yeah. ones. They're, they're still pushing them out. Huh. Check them out at your local record store soon. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Are we supposed to wind this down now? Yeah, or? I'm going to jump okay. in. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me just borrow that for a second. Sure. Oh, you got that one? Great. You told us to babble. So, we did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and don't worry. For, if you guys, if you millennials out there didn't catch the references to Jaco Pistorius, this will be annotated later. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted, before we, before we go, I uh, wanted to ask you guys, I had one question on my mind for each of you. Um, Paul, I'll start with you. Who is the, who's the hardest chef you've ever worked for? Like, threw things at you or had, gave you a rough time in the kitchen? You know, the, the, I, I've never worked for one of those guys. I mean, like, I think everyone that works for me would say that I'm, that I really nurture them and uh, I'm, I'm not a screamer, it's just pointless to me. I mean, I get uptight and probably my, my weapon is Jewish guilt. You know, I'll be like, what are you trying to sabotage me? Are you crazy? Uh, but I, I, I really, you know, Rick Bayless was really intense, uh, but I never, I never worked for, for, for anyone like that was psycho. <laughs> Not at all. So I know it's a bad answer. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, it's you know it's better for you that you never got abused. But um, Mark, uh, what about for you? You know, been on tour with some pretty big personalities. Any any musicians that's been hard to work with? <laughs> um, hmm. Off the record, no, uh, no, in, in, no. No one was really that hard. And uh, I've I've always been in bands with my friends, so that's never been a problem. I've seen some poor behavior by some other bands, um, but. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I don't want to. Oh, I, I have you guys failed behavior. this is good radio. I'm there, you know, I'm like gonna, when you go I'm to those festivals, we'll turn the cameras behavior. off, and then I'm going to get it out of them, and, and you can check us out on Talk House and Food Republic uh, for the real scoop here. But thanks so much to Mark and Paul for taking the time to come in, and uh, and please buy um, Paul's uh, cookbook, uh, The Publican Cookbook. Cheers, and, cheers to the Publican, and always listen to Pavement and Sonic Youth because it's good for your health. Thanks. <laughs>